Hello and welcome to you all again for this morning service. Glad you're able to join us as we learn, as we pray and as we worship together. It's good to be with you all. This morning David is going to be speaking to us again, further considering Jacob and his relationship with God as um, set out for us in Genesis. And this week, David's going to be looking at Jacob wrestling with God. So we look forward to what the Lord is going to say through him. But first, um, yes, you guessed it, just a few short notices. Number one, if you're able, could you please um, drop the questionnaire that's been sent to you either off at the post box at Burniston Church or our house or email. If you can do that by the end of the week, that'd be great. That's number one. Number two is just look out in your emails for as full information as possible as we can give you about the um, gathering that we're going to have on the 16th of August, probably from about one o'clock, um, a time when we're able to see each other again and also to give our thanks and our best wishes to David as he comes to the end of his time as minister at Burniston and we're able to say thank you to him for all that he has uh, brought to us and led us in over the last couple of years. It's good to know that although he's stepping down as our minister he'll still be around in the circuit but we thought it would be good to mark the occasion just by having a, a, a time together so all I can say at the moment is it's the 16th of August probably from one o'clock please remember to bring all the um, coronavirus safety stuff like bring your own chairs your own blankets your own gel your own food and um, we'll see how it goes Anyway, on with the on with the service. Um, this week, Paul and I were very fortunate in as much as we were able to spend some time with our grandchildren. And one of the days we went to the park and our granddaughter actually loves nothing better than spending all the time on a swing being pushed. And the higher she goes, the better she likes it. So I must have spent, well, I don't know how long I spent, uh, just pushing her higher and higher and higher. And the thing is, because she's very high, and of course I'm down on the ground very low, um, there isn't really much opportunity for conversation. So we enjoyed the activity in companionable silence. And uh, until I suddenly became aware of um, quite a sweet, but nevertheless loud, voice um, singing out and I'm, let me just get this right singing out God you are here with me everywhere I go um, you'll always be with me I'm never alone God you are with me everywhere I go I'll never be alone and um, as she was singing this out, I mean, goodness knows what everybody else thought, but she was having a whale of a time singing it. Uh, I suddenly thought how wonderful it is that she's growing up with that knowledge that God is with her everywhere she goes and she's able to sing it uh, so freely. And secondly, I then thought how sad actually it's been for many of us that we haven't been able to sing with such gusto and um, the togetherness of, of community, um, worship songs of praise and certainty like that. But then I went on to think, well, if a little three-year-old is able to sing and know such worship certainty, out of her small and fairly limited repertoire, how much more fortunate we all are that the songs that have been embedded in our spirits over the last, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 30, for some 50 years, um, how fortunate we are that they are in 
our spirits and that we're able to enjoy the encouragement and the certainty and hope that words from those songs bring us, whether we're singing them in our own little bubbles or whether we're listening to them online. But I thought it would be great if we could use some of the words of songs that you may well have forgotten that we've ever sung together, but we'll say the words as a prayer at the start of this service, if that's okay. So shall we pray? So Father God, we just thank you that you are our refuge. We thank you that you are our anchor. We thank you that you are our light and our salvation and therefore our hearts don't need to fear. We thank you that our hope is in you. We thank you that our hearts are directed to yours so that we can be joined in your company. And we thank you, Lord, that despite everything, knowing you is still the best thing that there is, the best thing that there can be. There's no greater thing than knowing you, Jesus, because you are our joy. You are the best. You are our strength and you are our righteousness. And for that, Lord, we love you. Thank you. Amen. So do enjoy the rest of the service and we look forward to seeing you next week and hopefully quite a few of us in person at the gathering on the 16th. OK, God bless. Good morning. Today's reading is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of the hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Thanks be to God for his word. This is Jacob. Hello. His name means deceiver. He is very aptly named because that is exactly what he did. He deceived or tricked his brother, didn't you, Jacob? We pick up the story years later, years after that wily Jacob had tricked his brother Esau out of his birthright. In those years, Jacob had become a very wealthy man, hadn't you, Jacob? Yes, I have. He had servants, he had horses, 
Okay, Maggie, you had horses. He had elephants. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe you had elephants. Um, he had anything else, Jacob? Rabbits. Okay, rabbits. <laughs> dogs. Yeah, okay, he had dogs. And a stripy alien named Ziggy. Hmm, maybe not. <laughs> now Jacob was journeying back from his uncle's house in Haran, knowing that eventually he would bump into his brother Esau after all these years. Jacob knew that Esau would still be angry with him and Jacob was afraid. Jacob, yes. what did you do? Um, I tricked Esau. How are you going to fix it, Jacob? I'll give him some presents. You give him some presents? Yeah. Don't you think you ought to say sorry? Um. Jacob decided to send his brother some presents. Will you take them yourself, Jacob? You want me to deliver them for you? Don't you think you ought to do it? Jacob was afraid. He said he would follow on behind. He was being a coward. He stayed behind as night fell. He was all alone. Then somebody appeared. Somebody mysteriously named in the Bible as a man. And we'll pick up the story in a moment. Testing, testing, one, two, three, one, two, three. Who put this on Echo? Echo. Honestly. Honestly. Crew? Crew? Ah, oh, there you are. Um, can you please just try and put this off echo? Thank you. <clears throat> See if this works. On. <clears throat> testing, testing, one, two, three. Yes, it's not echoing. So, finally. Here we are at the Lord's Stadium, and today our contestants are Jacob and, um, a man, is it? We, is that right? Um, no, we have no more information on him. Okay, the man v Jacob, the deceiver, who will win. It's all to fight for in this battle of strength. The pressure is really building here in the Lord's Stadium, and here they come onto the ring. Oh. One, two, three, four. I declare at the more bow, kiss, begin. Now, when the man saw that Jacob wasn't going to give up, he touched Jacob's hip socket and made it fall out of joint. The man said, let me go. But Jacob, who by now probably knew who he was wrestling, said, not until you bless me. The man said, what is your name? Jacob said, the, Jacob the deceiver. The man said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Israel means the Lord fights. Stop, stop. stop. Oh. Just like Jacob, we need to meet God for ourselves. He was alone in the dark and frightened. At some points, just like Jacob, you must realise that your life is your own. Your decisions are your own. You don't live for your mum and dad, or brother, or sister, or friend. Your life is your life. Your sin is your sin. When Jacob met God, the man, he wrestled with him and would not let go until God had blessed him. At some point, you will encounter God. You can either wrestle with him like Jacob or walk away. 
Will you be your own master or surrender to Jesus and allow him to take charge? This cornflower glute can be hard and solid. When it's picked up, it becomes flexible. It changes when we encounter it changes. When we encounter God, we have hard hearts and want to be totally in, in charge of our lives. But if we allow God to touch us, he will ch he will change us. Like Jacob, we will never be the same again. Hello everyone. Last time we journeyed with Jacob. If you recall, we remembered his dream when he stopped for the night on his escape, his fleeing from all that he'd done wrong by deceiving his brother Esau. Well today we're with the companion piece and this is the story of Jacob wrestling with God at the ford of Jabbok. So what's happened between these two stories? Well, Esau is out for revenge, it seems. Jacob has heard that Esau's on the way with 400 men, and that doesn't sound good. It sounds ominous, dreadful, terrible in fact. And so Jacob does the only thing he can. He gets his whole family, his servants, all his animals, huge camp, he divides it in two and they start moving away. But it quickly becomes clear that what he needs to do is try and make peace with Esau. So he sends groups ahead of him in the direction he thinks Esau is coming from. And so these groups journey ahead of Jacob and Esau is coming towards him. What this means is that Jacob has no way of avoiding a confrontation with his brother. It's going to happen one way or another, and what he's trying to do is mitigate the ferocity of it by sending these people ahead, saying that he's full of remorse, he is seeking forgiveness, he wants to put it right with his brother and have a good relationship, in the hope that when eventually Esau meets him, Esau will have changed his mind and won't want to kill him. And so they journey on and he crosses the ford of Jabbok and at that point sends the family on and stays back by himself because Esau now is very close, can't be that far away and so the terrible confrontation is going to happen. And this story of Jacob by the ford wrestling with God is what happens next and is the companion piece to God reaching out to him through the dream when he was convinced that God was in that place with him. So what's going to happen this time? One of the fondest memories I've got is of visiting my uh, granddad and nanny Chester in Bushbury in Wolverhampton, my mum's mum and dad. And if we were up there on a Saturday, for instance, uh, Grandad would be doing his roll-ups, he'd get a Rizzler out, and I can still see him making a, a cigarette and lighting it, and then settling down in front of the black and white telly to watch the wrestling, because he was a wrestling aficionado. He loved the wrestling. Mick McManus, Jackie Palo, he'd be glued to the set, and you knew not to interrupt Grandad when he was watching with his rapt attention, and even though it was all humbug and bogus and fixed, uh, as it was in those days, the spectacle was fabulous, and he was just drawn into it and loved it. And of course, I loved him, and loved him for his love of wrestling too. And if we approach the story of Jacob and his wrestling with God from that perspective, what we're looking at is a story about love. 
It's not a story about a God who is vengeful. It's not a story about someone who is lost to God permanently, but actually it's a deeply nostalgic story about the love which never lets us go, the love which holds us and cherishes us. So it's a story we look back on like I look back on my memories and recollections of my granddad, you know, with huge affection, huge fondness, for here is God meeting Jacob at a really significant moment in his life and not just helping him through but transforming him, challenging him, changing him in a really dramatic way. And that's the power of the story that we need to unpack. So Jacob stops and he's going to obviously settle down for the night but as that's about to happen, his nightmare becomes real in that an assailant attacks him and wrestles with him. Now, this isn't one of Esau's assassins. Um, Jacob isn't killed. It becomes clear to Jacob that he's wrestling with none other than God. So here he is filled with remorse, filled with regret, filled with longing to make it right with his brother, but more than that, filled with the terror of knowing that this could be his last night on earth and that death is approaching. And he wrestles all night, we're told, with God wrestles with an angel, wrestles with a man, but wrestles with none other than God. And I think this is hugely crucial for us as Christians and indeed as church. What's really striking in these stories in the Old Testament, and these two stories in particular, which concern Jacob, is that there is movement. It's not static. Jacob is on the move. He's not staying still. He is journeying. He is travelling because he needs to. The pressure is on him. And in both of these stories, the destination actually is quite unclear. It's uncertain what's going to happen. And so it's in the midst of all of that threat, uncertainty and peril that God chooses to intervene. Because it is God who chooses to wrestle with Jacob. It's not Jacob, it's God who plunges in and stops him in his tracks and decides that now is the moment for Jacob to sort himself out. And that's what ensues. They wrestle all night. And at the time that daybreak is about to dawn, Jacob hasn't won. God is still there. And God decides to end the matter and dislocates Jacob's hip. Now, this isn't God being vindictive. It isn't God wanting to hurt Jacob. But it is God wanting to bring this wrestling match to an end, to conclude it and to help Jacob move on. Because what's been going on with Jacob and God wrestling is that Jacob is having to sort out what he thinks about his faith. He's having to become clear about who God is to him. He's being confronted by God at the heart of his struggle and God wants to resolve it, transform him and put him on a very different path. And all of this sounds really familiar, I think, to us, because where we are in this part of emerging from lockdown, it's a struggle. It's uncertain. We're wrestling with so many things about who are we as church? How are we to continue? What's the future going to look like? Can we get back to worshipping in our building? What about all our groups? What about our mission? What about John's new ministry, which is just about to start? What shape is that going to have, uh, given all the restrictions we're working under? So I think we have a real feeling for Jacob in his wrestling match with God. There is a lot to resolve. There's a lot to sort out. And now is the moment God says, you're going to do that, and then you're going to move on. There's much to wrestle with. We wrestle with who we are, we wrestle with our relationship with God, we, 
wrestle with the things that really perplex us. We wrestle and we struggle with suffering and tragedy and pain. We wrestle and we struggle to speak of God in the anguish and the torment. We wrestle and we struggle with injustice and racism and poverty. We wrestle and we struggle with modern day slavery and exploitation. There's much we wrestle with. The biggest struggle of all, of course, is within ourselves as we wrestle to accept God's love and realise just how much God does love us and wants to transform us. And so in this time where we find ourselves as church, we're wrestling, we're struggling. And what what God is saying to us, I think, is that that's okay. That's, that's how it is, because we don't wrestle alone. We are wrestling with the living God. And as we wrestle with God, we are finding that the answers perhaps become a bit clearer in terms of who we are and who we need to be. The future may be uncertain, but it becomes clear that only through wrestling with the big issues that we face in our world and within ourselves can we ever make progress. We've got to wrestle to be transformed, wrestle to discover what salvation is like. Wrestle with God to be made new. And that's what Jacob is doing. He's wrestling with God. And he wrestles all night because it's not a quick fix. And he wrestles and in the morning when God calls a halt and hurts him in his hip, dislocates his hip, what Jacob does next is really, really significant and vital for us because he says he wants God to bless him. He hangs on to God. He won't let God go. He's hanging on until God has given him a blessing. And that's crucial because the whole point of the wrestling is that actually through it, God blesses us and we are gifted and changed by the experience. And that's true for Jacob. He wrestles, he demands a blessing, and God blesses him. And through that blessing, you and I are changed. You and I are different because Jacob wrestled by the ford of Jabbok with God. So, God wants to bless us. And God waits for Jacob to ask for it. All night long they've been tussling and wrestling and working things out. And Jacob won't let God go. He will not let God go until the blessing comes. And of course, God will only give the blessing when the moment is right. And Jacob has moved, has changed, has welcomed God's love into his heart and mind and body and soul and is changed by it. And when that moment comes, God pronounces the blessing. And it is life-changing. Indeed, it changes Jacob's identity, for he gets a new name at this moment. Because of his tussle, his wrestling, his struggle, because of his faithfulness that that struggle denotes, he now gets the blessing that changes him. And his name becomes Israel. It's where the name of the nation state comes from. In this moment, Jacob is given a name which embodies the promise given to his grandfather. And it's now truly his task. He is the one who embodies Israel and the hope, not just for his people, but the hope for all people. Which is fine and dandy, of course, but Esau is still coming towards him. There's still the threat, except this time Jacob is in a different place to meet it. And it seems as though the fear and apprehension have now gone. What's coming down the road towards him no longer feels like the catastrophe it once was. And so he goes out to meet Esau and indeed Esau is a different man too. He's been changed by God perhaps every bit as much as Jacob, even though we're not given that story as such. 
And when they meet the two brothers, there is a rapprochement, there is a real meeting of minds and hearts and a reconciliation. And from that moment, the future of God's people seems set on a new and hopeful course. None of that would have been possible had not Jacob been in the pit of despair and agony and grief and wrestled with God and wrestled honestly and brought all his questions to God, his struggle to God, his need to make sense. And his faithfulness was in keeping to the struggle, even though it went on all night long, even though he ended up being hurt through it. The hurt wasn't a punishment, it in its own way facilitated the blessing. So battered and bruised, Jacob gets a new name and goes forward. And our futures are as they are because of his story, his wrestling. We can face the future and wrestle with it and wrestle with all that is our struggle at the moment because Jesus, the heir of Jacob, wrestled with death itself and wrestled with death and overcame it. And from the heart of eternity, Jesus is risen and supreme on the cross that we can have the confidence that our wrestling is not in vain, that in all things, God works for good with those who trust him. That's the real blessing that we need to hold on to in this moment of challenge and uncertainty as we wrestle for the way ahead. Paul, speaking to the Romans, tells them there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And that's true. It was his truth. It's our truth. It was Jacob's truth. It's my truth. It's your truth. Nothing can separate us from that love. And that love will come to us and wrestle with us until we are in a place to receive the blessing which changes everything. I hope that's your truth. I hope God will bless you as you wrestle and struggle. I hope God will bless you in Jesus with the love that will never let you go. The love that brings you and me to life. Now there is a fascinating postscript to this story, uh, also in the Old Testament, in the book of Hosea, where Hosea actually references this very incident, this very story. Uh, In Hosea chapter 12, verse 4, um, the prophet tells us, Jacob strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favour. Now, this verse suggests that Jacob prevailed, that he he won the struggle uh, with God. But it's clear that that struggle, if it was a victory for Jacob, and it was, he got the blessing, I guess, it was at cost. For Hosea tells us what Jacob doesn't. Um, He tells us that Jacob wept and must have wept throughout the night time of struggle. Uh, And that's really quite revealing, I think. It shows us that in the end, Jacob surrendered that Jacob was all in, that he'd given everything he got. He was at his wit's end. He was was weeping and defenceless. And at that moment, his victory was assured because at that moment, that's when the love poured right in. Uh, And in his own way, I think, in his wrestling, uh, he found healing and he found solace as well as this new identity. So when we think about this postscript, it's clear that from the wellspring of tears, Jacob's blessing was born. His night of struggle was a night of weeping, every bit as much of a a night of eventual success and getting blessing from God. And that rings all sorts of bells for me because I think some of the most abiding and precious things in faith, they come from that wellspring of tears. They, they come from that place of distress and, and grief and real, real hard-won struggle. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian who was murdered by the Nazis in April 1945, 
he talked about uh, cheap grace and railed against the whole idea of cheap grace. And in this story of Jacob wrestling, we can see that actually grace isn't cheap if we are to believe it, own it, and let it become part of us and change us. Sometimes in our discipleship, it is the way of struggle and the way of tears, every bit as much as the way of joy and the way of laughter. And perhaps all those things are here in this story, because just imagine the joy that Jacob felt when he was reconciled with his brother. And that joy could only have happened because of his weeping and his surrender and his giving of everything he got to God so that God could bless him. And that's a powerful postscript, isn't it? So we journey on. We journey with Jacob. We journey with Jesus. We follow the path of discipleship into the unknown. And whatever lies ahead of us on the path, whatever obstacles we have to face, whatever struggles we have, we know that we will prevail because the God of love, risen and ascended in Jesus, is the God who will always be with us. The God who will come to us, hold us, struggle with us, wrestle with us, until that love puts us back on our feet and sets us perhaps in a new and even more hopeful direction. But wherever we walk, wherever we're headed, we have our companion with us all the time, who never leaves us. And all he wants to do is journey with us and bless us and send us forward as a blessing to those who most need it, especially those like Jacob, who were really in a tough, hard, unremitting and bleak place. God wants to send us to those people that we can accompany them, companion them in their wrestling to find whatever blessing it is that God so longs to give them. So where's your Ford of Jabbok? Where are you on your journey in that place where you're going to wrestle? and tussle with God. Wherever that place is, this story tells us there is always hope. Yes, the struggle can be really hard, bone-crushingly hard, painfully hard, dispiritingly hard, and yes, there will be tears. But the story tells us that through all of that, God is there, not absent, but there, holding tight, holding close, staying with us, intimately so. And that when we can accept it, God will give us a life-enhancing blessing to take us forward. That is a pearl of great price at the heart of this strange story, that no matter what the circumstances we face, God's will is always to bless us and bless us and heal us and put us back on our feet. So wherever your ford of Jabbok is, hold tight to that promise and that truth. Well, as we come now to our final part of our service, our prayers, I want to first of all thank David for his teaching from the reading of Genesis 32 really significant verses that are difficult to understand at first but the unpacking of them with the help of the Holy Spirit have revealed such a rich theme of the eternal truths and the love of God and his knowledge of our human nature. This is crucially significant for all of us today. 
Just to recap, here is Jacob alone at last, in darkness, the Bible tells us, facing a very real threat from his brother Esau, who has every right to be angry still and to hate him. And he's coming with an army of 400 armed men. Jacob is panicked. There's no doubt about that. Everything has threatened his family, his very future with God, for he knows the God of his fathers and he knows the promises that he's made to him. And it all seems to be on a knife edge. We see him in agony of mind and spirit. He's wrestling, I believe, essentially with his certain knowledge of God and his ability to, and his promise indeed, to deliver him versus his own personal instinct to be his own deliverer, to plan his own escape, to depend in his panic upon his own resources. So this gives us a really good opportunity to pray into this situation as it relates to us all at some time or another. So let's pray together. Um, always to a listening God and Saviour and bring all that we are and all of ourselves and all the things that trouble us to him now. Let we close our eyes in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your word. It is our inheritance as new covenant believers. We thank you for its power to open the eyes of our understanding wider and wider and to reveal you as our Saviour and our Lord, our refuge and our strength in all our fears and darkness. Lord, ours is the same struggle between our self-reliance and doubt and wholly trusting in you as was Jacob's. Lord, we are so aware of your often repeated promises to us as new covenant Christians. You promise never ever to leave us or forsake us. You have said, Lord Jesus, that there is no power that can pluck you, us rather, out of your hands. The Bible tells us that you know us personally and intimately. You know the things that trouble us and make us fearful. But Lord, we want to say together, we want to declare together today that our resilience and strength to be overcomers is only from you and can only come from you as we entrust our deepest selves to you. You have said, Lord Jesus, that in the world we will have tribulation, but that we should take heart, for you have overcome the world and its power to harm us. So we ask for your help, Lord, to see these things much more clearly. As the days that precede your promised coming come closer and closer, You've said that the world will grow darker and darker. We want to be a people in this world who will rely on you more and more. A people who will watch and pray with knowledge. A people who will contend for the faith which is challenged from all sides and the pureness of your word that we will, like Jacob, hold fast to you through thick and thin. We will say as Jacob did, continually, Lord, we will not let you go. And in saying this, receive that blessing and indeed the deliverance that Jacob 
and we can have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy we ask that you hear our prayer now, which we offer in the matchless name of Jesus. And so we all say the Amen together. Amen. God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.